My name is Christopher. I'm a 41 year old anal rectal metastatic mucosal melanoma survivor. I was diagnosed at age 36 uh, in 2018. Um, I fought this disease for 18 months before getting into a clinical trial. But prior to that, you know, I was a professional um, new home construction manager, very avid, you know, uh, sports related, you know, um, snowboarding, um, things of that nature. Um, I'm a very proud uncle of uh, six, uh, oh, excuse me, eight total nieces and nephews. <laughs> um, and, uh, you know, love my family uh, very much. And so, so in the beginning of 2018, I uh, had a, you know, a sweaty rectum and I didn't know what was causing it. And I quickly ended up growing. It was a very small little lump on my rectum. I thought it was maybe possibly a zit or something like that. Um, initially, I didn't do anything about it over time. It ended up growing to maybe the size of a dime. Um, and since there, there was no pain, there was no bleeding. And a few months after that, um, uh, this would have been in, like in May of 2018, um, I started to know that there was a lump that grew in my right groin and it grew rather quickly. And um, I went to the doctor to go have him look at that. I didn't associate anything between the two, you know, lumps at the moment, but I had the doctor look at it and he said that, you know, uh, here's some antibiotics, you know, uh, take them for 10 days, uh, come back. And I came back, nothing happened. He gave me a different antibiotic, same thing. And so for me to a general surgeon, to go get looked at he said he thought of my the lump in my groin was most likely a, a femoral hernia wasn't sure but the only way to find out is to you know get in there and and uh and cut it out um or he said if it was a hernia he would fix it and if it was not you know then we would go from there so when i woke up he said it was not a hernia it was a lymph node um he was able to get it out with clear margins and send it off to pathology and so since i had that week off i went to the uh, proctologist um, and proctologist, first thing he says when he saw it was, you know, what is my pathology from my surgery that previous week? And told me I hadn't come in yet, but it should be there by that afternoon or the next day. And he said, well, you know, until you find out, you know, we'll just we're going to put things on pause. And, you know, once you get your pathology, give me a call. And so I got the call from the surgeon. He said it's a metastatic form of malignant melanoma. Um, you know, uh, don't uh, look it up uh, and don't tell your family, but you know, make a call to the oncologist immediately. He gave me the number. And so, you know, since it was late on a Friday afternoon, um, you know, I uh, went ahead and made the call and I got an appointment for the following Tuesday on the books. Um, I did tell my family, um, you know, I wanted to make sure I had support, you know, they're coming with me. I didn't want to do any of it alone. And so they all came with me and everything. And, um, went to my first appointment uh, and the oncologist said, Hey, this is very specialized. Um, you know, uh, they could have been a numerous system types of melanoma, but since it is so specific, they said, you know, you do need a second opinion and um, recommended I go down to MD Anderson. So I started making the calls for that. And that's what jump started everything. Being that it is so rare uh, and there's only 1% of all melanoma, you know, there's maybe, like 700 or so people a year in the U.S. that get diagnosed with this. But yeah, they don't know what causes it. I was so in shock that you could get melanoma at other, other places other than your skin. You know, that was I've heard it, you know, cutaneous for skin cancer. Uh, you know, so anytime I've ever heard the word melanoma, that's the association with it. But the whole existence or the fact that, you know, you could grow melanoma, um, you know, where the sun doesn't shine, um, you know, just uh, blew me away. I, I had my one moment, you know, where I, uh, I just, you know, kind of like bawled and cried in the shower one day. And when I got out of it, you know, I dried myself off and it was kind of significant of like, all right, you know, starting fresh, um, you know, and uh, I was just, my mind, I was thinking, I'm just going to be, you know, overly optimistically positive, um, you know, and that's how I was going to approach everything and handle it all. Um, I didn't, you know, want to feel doom and gloom and, you know, uh, and have everybody around me be the same. And so I figured if I set the tone, you know, for, uh, for everything, then that would jumpstart both between my family, my friends and the doctors. And so um, it's essentially, I just kind of tell people, you know, that I uh, had to come outside of my own self, um, in a sense, you know, from uh, whatever it was I wanted to be or doing anything. And I had to just be so ultimately focused on, you know, gaining control, because you just feel you feel so uh, like, uh, out of control, like you uh, I don't want to say hopeless or helpless, but um, just uh, 
you know, you, you're just, you're at a loss because this is just so in, unique and different. I live up in Dallas and I got my initial diagnosis here. And so when I got down to the specialist, um, at that point, you know, I had actually had a second surgery. So they removed, uh, you know, once we knew what everything was, they removed the lump on my rectum. Um, and I, you know, I did a PET scan and when I got down to MD Anderson, that's when he told me specifically that it's, you know, mucosal melanoma and that it forms in mucous membranes. And so anywhere where you have, you know, the, you know, mucosa, you know, being whether it's vagina, rectum, ear, nose, and throat, um, that's, you know, where it is, you know, but it's extremely rare, you know, and so you have all the melanoma, you know, mucosal makes up 1% of all melanoma. And their survival rate, you know, is the average survival rate is like five years, um, which is uh, 14%. So, um, and then once it metastasizes, it's um, or less than, you know, nine months less than a year. But since it forms in the mucous membranes and everything, um, and it's always disguised either as a lump or a polyp or a hemorrhoid or something like that, it's usually um, at stage three or four by the time it is diagnosed. Because, uh, you know, for like my example, I had local metastasis. So I went from my rectum to my lymph node. And so I was stage 3C as a diagnosis. And, um, you know, eventually became stage 4 once it ended up going to all my um, different organs and everything. There's no standard, you know, one treatment works for all. And I, I did do the genetic testing and everything from the pathology. And I had a CDK4 amplification and an MDM2 mutation. And so, um, you know, it's kind of like the, all right, well, we'll start here, you know, in terms of like targeted therapy, um, you know, with the immunotherapies and such. Um, and the CDK4 is the same implication that a lot of breast cancer patients have. And so, um, you know, their initial thought was, you know, doing like a Keytruda, for example, um, you know, plus, you know, a chemo or this and that. But it was always going to be in a combination of something, uh, you know, because there was no one thing. And it was, we're going to try this and see if, you know, how the well that works. And then we move on to this. And it was just kind of felt like whack-a-mole, you know. <laughs> so clinical trial um, is called TILS and it stands for tumor infiltrating lymphocytes. And so uh, it's not like, you know, where you just go in and get an infusion and a medication. I mean, it's a process. And so, you know, after you're signing consents and everything, uh, there's this kind of a series of tests to make sure you're healthy enough to go through it, being EKGs, blood labs, things like that. But you have to have more than one tumor of a minimum size. And so they can extract one and then monitor the other. And what they do is they pull that tumor out. And they send it out to a lab and then they um, extract those cells and then they grow them into the billions. And, um, and why that's happening, it's like a 22 day process. Um, you know, you, uh, um, you know, you're just prepping, you know, to enter the hospital, but you enter the hospital and, uh, you know, you get a pick line in and uh, you have to do one week of chemo um, that uh, is a lymphodepletion. It brings your cell count down to zero. So your body's like a blank slate. And then what they do is they take the till, you know, that they manufactured into the billions and then they um, they give those back to you um, intravenously. Um, and then they follow that up by uh, up to six doses of IL-2 interleukin. And what that does is that um, that like jump starts the cells to get them to go. And so, you know, your cells in this, uh, how I explain it to everybody, but you got to imagine that your cells and the tills are Pac-Man. And um, you've got billions and billions of Pac-Man and they give them to you and they go throughout your body and they eat up all the cancer, like all the dots and cherries until they're gone. Um, and so, and once they do that, I mean, it's gone forever. It's not in remission. It's not asleep. It's not waiting to wake up. You know, I mean, it's just, it's not there. And so, and if it was to pop back up, you'll have, still have all those billions of cells in your body of your till and they will be there forever and they'll just eat it up. And so yeah, it's a, a pretty much, um, you know, from start to finish, you're looking at anywhere from uh, like three to four week process from time you uh, get your first surgery until you enter the hospital, um, you know, and then do your week of chemo depletion and everything. But the hospital stay, uh, you know, for me was about 12 days, um, and which is a minimum amount. But, you know, you have to definitely be there to um, you know, they, they basically, it's like taking the dial, turn it all the way down and then turn it back up. So all your levels and uh, blood counts and everything got to come back, um, you know, for them to release you. But while you're doing that, those, you know, six doses of IL-2 you get after your till, um, 
you know, that I say would be literally the last actual treatment that I ever did. So I signed all my consents in November 2019, and I was actually supposed to enter the hospital um, in December 2019. Well, right before I entered the hospital, they found brain metastasis, and it kicked me out of the trial. They actually said, you know, I might need to consider calling hospice, selling my affairs. Emotionally, I mean, I was just, I was tore up inside. You could just kind of feel the vibe, um, you know, having to fill out my will and, and do all that end of life kind of stuff. It was just... Uh, it, it was intense. I mean, it was, uh, it was extremely emotional. I mean, like, you know, I would have done anything in the world to stay alive. You said I need to drink a gallon of gasoline. I was going to do it. I mean, whatever needed to be done, I was going to do it. And so um, I just kind of looked at it like, you know, um, I got no choice. And if I'm going out, I'm going out trying. Because the only way to get back in was to um, to reduce or stabilize my brain metastasis. And so uh, in order to do that, we needed radiation treatment. And so, but the actual trial was closing. So I was on a very strict timeline um, to get that fixed. And so um, I basically, the very last day for me to scan or rescan to show that, you know, uh, my brain, you know, metastasis was good was Christmas Eve. And so um, I ended up uh, needing five doses of radiation. I didn't actually have time to do you know, five days of radiation. So I did it in four days. And on the fourth day, they gave me a double dose. And so I went to, um, and that was on, and yeah, that was on December 23rd. And then on the 24th, I literally, I went and scanned on Christmas Eve. And then I had to wait, you know, and fill out my will and end of life things and all this and that. And um, flew out to Colorado on January 2nd, saw the doctor on the third. She said, Hey, you know, everything's all good. Um, well, not all good. I mean, it actually had pseudo progression. It goes up before it comes down, but it was good enough to let me back into trial. So I entered the hospital on January 8th, 20, uh, 2020, um, started doing my chemo depletion on January 15th, 2020. That's when they gave me my till. Um, and, uh, and then I did my six doses of vial two and I was released from the hospital on January 20th, 2020. So the way with the trial works was, uh, you know, I got released in the hospital and the day they give you your till when you're in the hospital they call that day zero or day one um you know and they uh, so from that on it's six weeks um you scan and then six weeks after that you scan but then after that you just scan every three months so i started showing that everything was working um you know on my scans it wasn't drastic you know marks but it was either stable or in reduction you know nothing new and everything and within less than a year i want to say about nine months they started showing signs that i um, had a complete metabolic response and so um, we followed up on my next set of scans um and you know with additional pet scans along with my cts and mris and everything and in january 2021 literally like a year to the date that they told me that uh you know i, I was able to get back into the trial i think it was january 3rd you know but that yeah that my my scans um, showed that I did have a complete metabolic response. Nothing lights up on a pet anymore. Everything is completely gone. Um, yeah, there's a, a couple of spots, you know, but they're necrotic and calcified. Um, and so they use those as the markers um, when I when I still go and get scanned every three months. But that's all I do now is every three months I go in and I get full body um, CTs, um, abdomen, pelvis, and then also a separate lead for, for uh, my neck. And then I do brain MRIs. So I'm, I actually ended up having three surgeries to the same spot where that original lymph node in the groin was. So I have nerve damage, um, you know, from my knee to my hip. Um, you know, you see my hair is all white and everything. The treatments and everything completely wiped everything out. And it came back like this, including my, my eyelashes. And so, um, you know, I still have chronic pain, chronic fatigue. Um, I deal with uh, the immunotherapy treatments um, through my thyroid out. So I have hypothyroidism. Um, I have to take a, you know medication for that for the rest of my life. Um, I end up having to go do sperm banking right before my first radiation in my rectum, you know, because that was going to kill all my chances for ever being able to have. So the clinical trial and all my treatments, it, you know, completely wiped out all my melanocytes. And so um, as my pigment's trying to come back and everything, um, I'm very susceptible to sunburns. And so I have to um, definitely wear, you know, UPA clothing, hats, um, sunglasses, but long sleeves and, and pants year around pretty much. And, you know, definitely um, doing a lot more sunscreen than I used to. Um, but, you know, the uh, also the treatments, the immunotherapy treatments, I believe it was, that's what caused I end up having uveitis. 
um, right before I went into my clinical trial and I uh, developed cataracts. And so, you know, I'd never even been to an optometrist or an eye doctor. I had perfect vision. Um, and so um, I ended up having a cataract surgery and everything. But um, uh, now all my sunglasses and eyeglasses, I need prescription glasses as well. You know, um, I was uh, I was clinically declining, you know, and so I was extremely just, um, I don't know, it was very kind of sad situation in a sense because the entire time throughout my treatment I always had this optimistic positivity and this and that and even though I was walking around with stage four cancer and everything like you wouldn't tell by looking at me you know because it riddles you from the inside when you do all the different types of treatments you know like the immunotherapy and everything you don't look sick like you do you know with like chemotherapy or some of those other types of treatments and so I never really like looked, you know, or felt, you know, until that very end of it, I, I always saw myself like, hey, you know, you're going to make it. Um, you just, you know, you can't uh, really describe, you know, how you're going to do it until it, it's done kind of a thing, you know. So in my mind, I, I always thought I was going to make it. Um, I never doubted at all, you know, that I wasn't. And, um, you know, as, as, as bad as everything got and hurt and everything, I still was just like, you know, if I was going out, I was going to go out with a legacy that people wanted to talk about, you know, because I, you know, it was kind of my, my zone and my thought. I'd never been to an oncologist prior to this for any reason. I mean, um, you know, barely even knew what it meant, you know, and so um, all my, I had, you know, three different organizations I worked with and all of them, um, you know, were, were very uh, receptive and everything because I kind of came in like this bubbly, positive, you know, like we're going to beat this kind of attitude and um, and the tone. And so, you know, everybody was uh, kind of very receptive and welcoming. Now, I did, you know, have some doctors to where, you know, you just, you know, doc some doctors, I think they're just so smart that their bedside manner, you know, is just you know, they're just their people skills are not the same because they're in labs their whole life, you know what I mean? And so I actually had um, a fellow, you know, that came and gave me my news that, you know, I had metastasized, you know, and I thought, you know, I, I had no clue. And he came in and told me like I already knew, you know, but and so that always kind of upset me. I was just but the doctors, um, you know, I was very uh, persistent on what I wanted and when I wanted and having a sense of urgency. And I kind of approached it like I built houses, you know, I used to be a home builder. And that's what I was doing at the time when I was going through all of this. Something needs to happen every day was always kind of my mindset. You know, if, if they're scheduling anything, um, it needs to happen now, not later. Um, you know, and so definite sense of urgency. If, you know, there was time in between, it just seemed like wasted time. And so I was very persistent about always staying on top of that. And actually, about a year ago, um, I departed from, you know, the job I was working at. And I told myself, I was like, I'm not going to make all my decisions in life based on money because I was just working just to work. You know what I mean? Um, I wasn't really living life. I was just working to pay the bills and just rinse and repeat. And so um, I'm starting to tell my story more often and talk about everything. And I could see the kind of reception I was getting. And it's just made me feel so good. And I just refused to believe that I went through everything to not have it be of value, you know, and not necessarily like monetary value, but to the other people that want to, you know, have an example of, hey, you got this too. It's super rare. You know, what did you do? How did you come on the other side? And so, you know, I um, still don't necessarily know how I'm going to do it, but I was like, well, I, uh, I'd love to be an inspirational speaker or something, but I want to be able to travel around and tell people about my story. I guess I feel like I've learned to live a you know, more meaningful life, you know, compared to everything because of the experience. And it's just, you know, I don't have the, you know, actual physical or mental energy to want to go do what I used to do. Uh, you know, and so the energy I do have, I want to put towards, you know, more positive and, you know, good and being able to help. I'm a big believer in, you know, your your mental well-being is connected to your physical well-being. And so they both kind of got to be in harmony. And so, um, you know, if you're in a place or position or, or whatever in your life and, you know, it's causing you anguish and stress, you know, it's just not worth it. Um, and so um, when it comes to this cancer and everything, just or cancer in general, I mean, but it's a, the whole sense of urgency, um, you know, um, and self-advocacy. You know, I often tell people, I'm like, you got to remember, like, you're the ones that are paying the doctor. All right. You're the ones paying the oncologist. They work for you. All right. If anything is ever off or wrong, you know, with your body, like, go get it checked, period. It doesn't matter where it's at or what's going on. But, you know, just assuming it's something when you don't literally know, 
for a fact, you know, it can kill you. So I tell people, I mean, um, sense of urgency and um, of, you know, taking the time and making it a priority because I didn't make it a priority when I was first diagnosed, you know, or prior to that. It's okay to talk about it. You know, I didn't, you know, talk about a lot of the emotional stuff or anything when I was going through it. I just all started doing that over the last couple of years, you know, but I just, um, you know, it was, you know, it was so rare that, you know, people had more uh, questions than I had answers for. I, you know, I recommend everybody and everybody out there, you know, um, believe in yourself, you know, and, you know, because you're the one setting the tone. And so um, definitely if anything's ever off, you know, you go get checked and, you know, who cares about the consequences, <laughs> you know, uh, uh, take off work, do what you got to do, but definitely say something, do something. All right, right? Uh, yeah.